Okay, so good morning, friends. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back again this Sunday, and uh, I'm very happy to announce that we have with us today Dr. Vikas Reniwal and his wife, Dr. Ansu Chaudhary. So I extend a very warm welcome to both of you. And I also want to thank you on behalf of the Kashmuti Study Circle in Dor that you could spare your time to be with us. I think both of them would be speaking uh, on a common topic, if I if I'm right, Kashmuti's educational vision and parenting. So they'll be sharing their reflections on this topic. And uh, many of us know Dr. Vikas Deniwal, so I'll uh, briefly introduce him. Dr. Anshu Chaudhary is new to this group, so I'll introduce her as well. Dr. Vikas Deniwal uh, is currently serving in the capacity of assistant professor at the Delhi University in the Department of Education. He has been a general fellow for his postdoctoral work at the Indian Council of Philosophical Research, that is ICPR. He completed his doctoral studies at the University of Delhi in education in 2015. Overall, he has about 12 years of experience in school teaching, higher education, research, and administration. He has many publications to his credit, and his key research interests include intersubjectivity, dialogue, inclusion, mental health, self, and identity. Uh, Dr. Anshu Chaudhary is also serving in the capacity of assistant professor in psychology at the Impress College for Women, University of Delhi. She had about 15 years of experience in higher education, research, and HR consulting. She has completed her doctoral research on experiences of alienation from the Department of Psychology, University of Delhi. Her areas of expertise include self, identity, qualitative research, methods, philosophy of psychology, organizational behavior, and social psychology. Anshuji is an avid reader of stories and is deeply interested in narrative psychology and narrative practice. So with this brief introduction, uh, I'd leave it to Dr. Benival to decide who is going to speak first. And uh, it could be perhaps 35 minutes each or any way you want to divide it so that we have about 20, 25 minutes for people to ask questions or share their uh, understanding on your talk. So with these words, I'll request Dr. Vikas Benival to decide who is going to speak first. And uh, we can begin that now. Yes, Dr. Vikas Benival. Thank you very much, sir. So we, uh, uh, since the topic is shared and uh, uh, even the uh, idea is quite shared, so we thought that we will uh, take turns in sharing and probably pitch in uh, each other's discussion as well. So I would like to first uh, request Anshu to begin. Okay. Anshu, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dubey, sir, for that very kind introduction. And uh, I just want to take it forward from that point and uh, share uh, with all of you uh, where exactly are we coming from and what is our position uh, when we are engaging in this talk. So uh, we are proud parents of a two-year, five-month-old toddler. And he's very, very bright and curious. And uh, today we are, in, we are here in dual capacity. One, we are here in capacity as parents to talk about our experiences of parenting um, a, a toddler uh, and how our parenting is informed by Krishnamurti's ideas. Uh, who we, um, we think we are immensely enriched in our personal lives and in our professional lives uh, with thought of uh, Krishnamurti and how we are bringing that understanding to our parenting. So as parents, we want to reflect on that. And in addition, uh, we are also coming from the space of academics uh, and practice. So we are both uh, educators. We are both uh, working in higher education. 
so in our capacity as academics we are uh, also here to reflect on these ideas as academicians so that's the dual uh, position that we bring to this talk uh, so i just want to talk a little more about myself and about vikas of course so both of us as you already know we are working with the university of delhi we both are in higher education though we teach different disciplines both of us have a training in psychology so vikas teaches education and i teach psychology uh, so uh, you know we within psychology and within education both of us come from a belief in the humanistic existential perspective where we believe that there is an inherent goodness in human beings and we all want to realize our potentials we want to we are compassionate we are caring we are curious and that's also a position that we bring to our classrooms and to our research so uh, that's one position that i wanted to share with all of you our beliefs and um, uh, our experiences of parenting have immensely uh, made us reflect on what it is to uh, educate students and what it is to care for a child and somewhere both these ideas they come together as they do in the thought of krishna murti uh, so yes i will be uh, maybe drawing some insights from psychology vikas of course will be drawing some insights from both education and psychology and of course philosophy as well so uh, we are taking this talk more like a conversation and a dialogue so there would be things that i uh, want to talk about and there would be things that vikas want to talk about so we'll keep on alternating between ourselves and uh, we will spend uh, some time talking to begin with but when when then we look forward to your uh, questions and comments and feedback and building on that understanding together because as i understand all of you are also a uh, very avid readers of krishna murti and we look forward to uh, learning much more from all of you <laughs> so yeah on that note uh, the first thing that i want to reflect on uh, regarding this topic uh, that we have for today is that uh, when do we decide that uh, why first of all we want to have children why we want to become parents and how do we decide when is a good time to go ahead with it these are hardly uh, questions that people are asking because somewhere being parents and so we live as we live our lives as part of a script so you're supposed to educate yourself you're supposed to get a job and you're supposed to get married and then uh, soon you're supposed to have children and it seems to be the right way and the desirable way of going about doing things uh this was also part of the expectation when both of us got married our respective families wanted us to have children and uh they all had their own reasons for that desire uh but throughout so uh, both of us uh, advait is our first child and uh, we had him after 10 years of our marriage which is very unusual as per indian standards and as per indian society so everybody would assume that there is something wrong with you if you don't have children as yet for us it was uh and i am a feminist i want to also share that understanding where i'm coming from um i always wanted to question this very idea that you know everybody takes it for granted that one would want to become a parent but i always question this and ask myself that do i really want to become a parent and when uh, am i ready to take on this immense responsibility and it took me a lot of time to come around and be confident that yes uh, i am ready for being a parent so we took our own time in deciding uh, and we did ask this question that do we really want to be parents and what is our reason for wanting to be parents do we want our family's name to be perpetuated do we want to fulfill uh, some of our desires and ambitions that we could not through our children or simply whether having children is a source of emotional gratification for us what is really the reason that we want to have children or a child for that matter and um, we very consciously decided that we will only go ahead and have a child when we think that we are really ready for this very big move in our life so it was a very very conscious decision and we took it almost 8 9 years of us being married 
most of the time in indian cultural context uh, people tell you that uh, you know you're never ready to have children or once you will have children you will know how to bring them up or uh, you you basically uh, it's it's a part of a natural cycle to have children and often we see that couples under such societal pressure or family pressure they go ahead and have children and find themselves immensely unprepared for this one of the biggest and most challenging roles of their lives and that was one position that we did not want ourselves to be in though i can hardly say that we were all prepared when we had adwait uh, it was still a matter of a lot of learning and taking each day as it comes uh, but at least we were prepared for that not so easy journey uh, and that immense responsibility that lay ahead of us uh, so uh, first and foremost it has to be a conscious decision to go ahead and have children rather than taking it as a part of a scripted life that the culture and the family would tell that we have for us so uh, on that note i think i would now invite pikas to take this discussion forward thank you very much so uh, here is adwait <laughs> and uh, so we are sitting in different rooms intentionally so that at least one of us get to say uh, and talk in peace rather than uh, trying to take care of him but he is very sweet in that sense and very understanding that he he knows that this is a session and so he has an intuitive understanding about space about people about what 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 is appropriate even though nothing of it has been explained to him and it was the pandemic when he was born so we were we were already taking classes so he knows that taking classes is a part of our uh, daily routine and it's our responsibility and we have to do it yes okay you, you want to go uh, go nijan so uh, the first thing that we uh, uh, decided and which was uh, probably at the center at the center of our idea of parenting is uh, that that we should not force anything on him so i think that is first thing that we decided that we, as as krishna murthy would put it a natural childhood so let him be free let him do whatever he wants to do let him be spontaneous let him explore let him talk to people let him fall and uh, in that you know keep a check on our tendencies as grown ups to instill dependency to be possessive to be in control uh, to seek fulfillment of your own needs and ambitions through the child so that was one thing that we very consciously decided we are not going to do uh, the second thing was that uh, in in our personal spaces we found out and we experienced that uh, people live a very compartmentalized life yes baby it's okay you, you can look at mama from this come so uh, we live very compartmentalized life there there is a compartmentalization of work and play of, of personal and social of leisure and education and work so we decided that let us not live in that Uh, compartmentalized world so we uh, intentionally focus on language on uh, on on uh, on our own actions that we mean what we say and we do what we mean and 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 we that that is what we try so the, the, we we are aware that generally parents say that uh, beta ye kaam karo and then you can play so we make sure that we don't do that adu come come this side beta please yeah come this side beta mamma mamma yeah so that is what we decided next uh we decided that we 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 should give Uh, we should respect his voice 
So, for example, uh, we remember when he was about three to four months old. Uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, Anshu. He started uh, uh, asking for bottle uh, of milk and asking for food, and and he never ate anything which he did not want. So he always told us what what would he like to eat, what would he like to do, where would he like to go, how and where he would like to sit and eat, all that. So that was another uh, very onwards. When we started feeding him, that six months onwards. So six yeah. months till a year, we focused on this. Yeah, and also before that, we couldn't even make him drink milk from his bottle without him asking for it. So that was another thing. Uh, so we we valued his ideas, his experiences. So our belief was in in the innate values of being a human. Uh, so so the intuitive uh, knowledge that the baby gains, the every child gains, and the natural capability of empathy and love. So we valued in all of it. Uh, so the first dilemma uh, that we faced was to what extent should we include him, should we make him or should we teach him about social values and beliefs. So uh, we decided that uh, as a principle, we will not introduce him to any uh, unreal or metaphysical idea. So he has no idea of God, of ghosts, of fairies or uh, uh, he, has, he has no idea about uh, anything which is unreal. And, and so we thought that uh, he, he, we should let him be ready to choose these ideas for himself. Uh, so, so basically, we, we were following Krishnamurti's idea of holistic development. And uh, I must share, it's not easy. So talking about it is but living it is not. Anshu, over to you. Yeah, so I want to uh, maybe share some more details about the kind of challenges we are facing. So we are all part of a social fabric. We all live in families and different people have different orientations. And often um, uh, our parents and uh, my parents and Vikas's parents and people around us they don't necessarily uh, share the same kind of value system as we do, or they're not approaching parenting uh, inspired by uh, Krishnamurti's ideas, or they don't have that uh, uh, psychological perspective or that educational thought that we want to base our parenting on. So often it is, so for example, both of us are like working parents and uh, we spend time away from home at work. And during those hours, he's mostly with his grandparents and they are the, alongside us, they're also the primary caregivers for him. So uh, their value system, for example, my mother-in-law, she worships every morning and Advait observes that. So it is though our ideal scenario would be such that we would not want him to have a concept of God, but he does because he sees his grandmother doing puja he also, without understanding maybe the idea of Shiv, he knows that there is something like Om Namah Shivai. There is something like you have you fold your hands and you pray. So all these, this socialization that children go through as part of their upbringing, that is something that we understand that he will have. But it's like at least a conscious alternative perspective that we want to offer. So rather than reinforcing uh, that idea of God or religion or, uh, let's say, political orientations or uh, uh, what it means, for example, to be an Indian, um, what it means to be a Hindu. All these thoughts are something that we are consciously keeping him away from. And this is inspired uh, by our own personal leanings that we want Advait to be his own person. And it is also inspired by Krishnamurti's idea that uh, if we truly love our child as parents, would we introduce him to the idea of God? Would we introduce him to the idea of nation? Would we talk about politics? Would we talk about religion? Because that gives a script uh, to the child to follow. And that 
in a way takes away from his own intuitive sense of authentically who the child is or what the child will grow up to be devoid of all these social conditionings. So uh, that's one struggle that we face. We understand that we cannot do it perfectly. We also, of course, value our family members and we value their presence and the care that they have for Advait. But at the same time, while they continue to be who they are as caregivers, we are consciously choosing to a certain extent make him at least aware that these are not uh, taken for granted ideas that he also has to subscribe to or him being a good boy will be contingent upon him doing puja or believing in what we believe or following what we want him to believe. I think we would want to encourage him to uh, find his own path rather than walking on the path that either, either one of us or anybody else uh, has laid out for him. I, I think we would like him to pave his own path. So over to you, Vikas. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, he does sit with my mother and he often, uh, you know, says Om Namisha. And when we exercise sometimes, he says Om Shanti Shanti. But uh, the, uh, from our side, that's, that has never been something that he should do or, or he should not do e either way. Uh, and, and there are some other things like, uh, you know, not introducing him to screens. So uh, thankfully, uh, even uh, uh, my parents and our extended family, they, they all uh, more or less agree with this, that when he's around, there should be no TV, there should be no uh, video watching on phone or scrolling, mindless scrolling on phone. So uh, that way he's not that introduced to screen. But when whenever we go for a function or someplace else, uh, like in a banquet, then he, he looks at screen. So he's attracted to them. So we, we understand that attraction also. Uh, recently, we went to a mall and he got uh, fascinated and uh, uh, captured by the light and sound in a video game parlor. So, uh, so th 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 there sometimes we, we, we face this dilemma that it's, it's his natural urge to get attracted to light and sound and, you know, uh, uh, different screens. So, uh, it, if, if we are doing natural parenting, then we should have, you, we should let him. But then again, we know that these things themselves are not natural. So uh, they, there is a dilemma then. Then what should we do? How do we go about it? Uh, so so, uh, so the guiding principle in even in this has been uh, probably how he is when he engages in these activities. For example, uh, if we take him to a nearby, uh, but uh, it, it's actually a medicinal garden. It's not a park. Uh, so, but they sometimes allow people inside. And then there are so many peacocks there. And he gathers their feathers, runs after them. He sees them drinking water, different animals, dogs, squirrels, uh, crows and peacocks drinking water from the same pond. And he's fascinated by them. He's, his, his, his whole imagination, his whole being is captured by that, uh, that moment. And he loses himself in it. He just stands there, observes. And probably if someone can identify someone being in the state of choiceless awareness that Krishna Murthy talks about, probably that is the moment where nothing else matters for him. So uh, these are the moments which we value and we which we want him to relive. So we don't tell him that, yeah, yeah, observe, observe, look, look, look. We don't have to tell him anything. He just does it on his own. So his curiosity, uh, his, his exploration and his quest to name things I mean, names are uh, so unnatural uh, of things. You know, the, it's the first thing that we, encounter, we, we introduce children to. But in order to talk about things, he wants them named. He asks, he kya hai? Iska naam kya hai? Because he wants to talk about it. So, 
so that experience is not just an intellectual experience it's an embodied experience where so so whenever he finds a cloth which is very soft he will feel it he will rub it on his face he will just you know uh, embrace it and experience it fully so whether it is a peacock feather or water for that matter he he, he loves water and and then plants so or or music uh, he he would often uh, i mean i i have a record of him uh, trying to sing at 8 months probably and then correcting himself so he was singing nani teri mor ni ko mor le gaye so there was a line uh, nani amma nani amma rusa rusi chhod de so he was saying rusi rusa and then he repeated it mumbled it rusi rusa rusa rusi and then the moment he captured it he sang it again so we heard i mean uh, scholars like piaget tell, tell us uh, that uh, children can't do metacognitive activity till they are uh, 7 or 8 years of age or maybe 11 but we we observed him correcting himself and there are various such um, moments that we uh, have observed we have noted we have written about so uh, so the, these i don't know whether we can call them instinctual but uh, yeah maybe they are instinctual but these uh, aspects of experiencing which are innate let let me be let me be broader innate are what we try to uh, nurture in him uh, you want to add something anshu here yeah i i want to say that looking at him being absorbed in the moment uh, paying attention to the finest details of things and just completely experience that moment it inspires us to do the same and there are so many ways in which we are learning from him so as parents you know we are constantly uh, questioning that dominant narrative around us that how and what parents should do in order to do it right and it's not easy because there's so many ways in which uh, you know this whole idea of parenting has been capitalized so, you know, you, sh you need to have educational toys, you need to send your child to a particular kind of school, you need to uh, engage with your child in, so to say, quality time. And uh, there's so many ways in which the world is trying to dictate what parenting should look like. And somewhere or the other, no matter how well-intentioned many of these positions are or uh, how well founded in research many of these perspectives are but they're nonetheless givens and they take us away from that natural capacity to be in the moment um, in our entirety with the child so i think parenting often is a, just about being with him uh, just observing him in his different moods just letting him do different things as he's exploring them and just being around like like you know maybe i don't know if this metaphor is all right or not but we are just there in nurturing capacity we are just there to create a context for him we are just there to make sure he's safe and he has everything that he needs uh, to actualize his own potential and that's where also our humanistic existential leanings are coming in so um, we don't want to have our own impositions and it's very difficult because both of us are educators. You know, we understand when it comes to human development, what is right and what is not right, what is expected at what stage, how should we teach him. So we have all these ready-made constructs and ideas of what is right and what is not right. And for us to do away with that conditioning, along with those social voices, ke ye parents ko karna chahiye. And we better do it right because we are both like we are both psychologists and we are educators. So if we don't do it right, who will do it right? So keep all voices in the back seat. Mein rakhe, uh, to be in that moment with him, observe him um, and understand that, okay, let him lead us into parenting him rather than us having that mold and then force fitting him into that mold because we know that mold is right. 
um, that is something uh, we constantly and very consciously make sure that we don't do. So actually, we are letting him lead the way, and we are trying to follow him and uh, and keeping him safe all this while. So there are times where we uh, where we lose our patience, and that is not because he's not doing what we want him to do, but because we are concerned either for his safety or we are just afraid of too many adventures that he's having or there's this constant struggle. We want him to make his own decisions. We value his opinion. We started giving him choices right from the beginning, whether you want to eat this or eat this. What is it that you want to do? When we step out of the house, we ask him, Acha, where do you want to go? And we are giving, we are consciously trying to give him that agency, that choice, that voice. But it's clearly coming at a cost to us because then it takes a lot on our part to make sure that we keep on giving him that choice. And there are times where we face difficulties because we are not trying to impose ourselves on him. And he's not old enough to understand reason or understand uh, convenience. <laughs> so there are times where we find both of us contemplating, we have not given autonomy, but then the next voice comes in, that autonomy is autonomy. There is no scope of more or less. So uh, the way we look at ourselves is that we are not, uh, so what it really means to love a child, um, that love is not same as possessiveness, that love, and as Krishnamurti would say, that love is not about control, that love is about care. And how do we care without being possessive? And how do we care without being controlling? That is something that we are, uh, you know, that's one of the gui guiding principles that we follow that in everything that we do. Uh, so also, uh, while uh, preparing ourselves to be parents, uh, one thing that I did uh, was to try to find alternative frameworks, which could gel well with uh, this perspective. So for example, uh, in philosophy, I found uh, this whole movement uh, known as philosophy for children, uh, sometimes also known as philosophy of children or philosophy with children, which which uh, argues that you know unlike the uh, dominant understanding, children are born philosophers. So this this uh, this uh, idea of child as lacking into something, we we will question that. So. We, even in psychology, there are studies which talk about, uh, uh, for example, I have books like the moral molecule, that the child has more inbuilt moral compass. You don't, it, 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 it need not be gained from outside. So when I read that book, we did this experiment. Uh, I think he was uh, eight or 10 months old. And uh, the book uh, had a case study of a 13 month old that the parent was trying to push something and was saying, oh, it's not getting pushed. And the baby came and helped. So uh, there is a swing that we have at home. So we, we pretended of uh, pretending that we are lift, trying to lift the swing and we are not able to lift. And he observed, he came and helped, tried to helping us lift the swing. So uh, there has been, uh, you know, uh, so it, it's not that we are rejecting all academic knowledge. Uh, but rather trying to find the principles behind or the assumptions of that academic knowledge and whether it gels with Krishnamurti's perspective and, and this whole idea of uh, uh, raising an autonomous, authentic child or not. Yeah. So that, that's... So now we have many dilemmas. So he's about two years, five months old. People ask her. I want um, to add one thing because before we reflect sure. on so many dilemmas that we have about the way we are doing things, whether they are right or not right. So uh, none of us, I mean, often uh, parenting, especially in our cultural context, it's like even before the child is born to the parents, they have their own set of ambitions uh, that they have for their child. They want a certain kind of life. They want their child to be successful. They want their child to uh, go to a particular university or get into a certain profession or become this or that. 
and often that uh, desire comes from a space of uh, that you know that the child should take forward your name or the child should be able to uh, make a mark in the world or the child uh, should do whatever the parents could not accomplish i want to say that very consciously we have decided and it also doesn't come very naturally to us we don't want him to become an engineer or a doctor we don't want him to uh, necessarily go ahead and you know be like go ahead or do phd or uh, do something that we want him to do i think it's also we want him to uh, be an independent person and just what it means to be a good caring loving person that may not like in our definition um i think these ambitions they don't fit anywhere we don't want to face uh, like we don't want to impose any of our ideas of success uh on him i think we would want him to come up uh with these ideas for himself on his own and whatever we want to do to empower him in that direction is something we think is our responsibility yeah so hopefully this will give you a little backdrop to understand what dilemmas vikas will be talking okay. about because yeah. many of these dilemmas are about education because we of course have our own roles role as parents but uh, education of course has its own uh, significance in his life so yes over to you vikas so uh, as i was saying the question that we are often asked these days is whether we are going to send him to a school or which school are we uh, going to send him so uh, even this idea of sending him to a school uh, at least scares me because i have seen uh, 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 young natural babies getting lost in uh, in 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 the world of screens and cartoons and all that i i had a, a very disappointing experience when uh, my nephew went to school so uh, so one criteria that we have been trying to find out i mean we have is uh, whichever space we are going to send him whether it be independent classes or a school it shouldn't have a screen uh but yes of course some day he will be introduced to screen so that's also there so screens are part of our uh, context these days no matter where you go there are screens and uh, if the baby is not aware of the screens then they get even more attracted to them so uh, so that's another that how so for example our phones he has access just to just the main screen and uh, the music app so he doesn't know how to read but he knows all his songs there are about 25 songs that he or 32 now that he listens to and he and he he is able to identify those songs through the image uh their their uh, the photo that are there that comes with the uh, song so he has access to that he can listen to whichever song he wants he doesn't know that there are more songs so sometimes he tells us from yesterday he told us kuch aur sunao so you want to listen to something new so we found out something new and we played and then if he likes it we add it to his playlist uh so so how much access to screen should he has uh, sh should he have then uh, schooling itself i mean i am a teacher educator i uh, i i educate people uh, future trainers actually in b ed and m ed courses so teachers and teacher educators so uh i know that our curriculum the of the mainstream curriculum doesn't have these components where where these anti establish not establishment but the 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 uh, i should say the the margin the, these alternative perspectives are marginalized so they they are there in the curriculum we we teach krishna murti in our curriculum but that's just one component and as a thinker not as the foundation of development growth and education so uh, and and uh, krishna murti schools are not nearby so that's another uh, uh, dilemma that adds to the dilemma <laughs> do you want so, to add so uh, it's 
technical tussle between uh, what the kind of environment we are building currently building at home and we have largely been able to do so because uh, his mobility is limited he is ve still very young but the moment he steps out in the world uh, in a school or when he meets a peer group or when he meets uh, teachers uh, how would we be able to have some degree of control on what is it the kind of values we want him to get it's very difficult because the larger larger like like the dominant values in the society they're not in sync with what krishna murti would like those to be so the teachers for example you know they have very fixed notions of what it means uh, who are the good children in the class they're mostly the ones who are obedient they are mostly the ones uh, who get good marks they are mostly the ones uh, who they think will go ahead and become something important in future we don't want those impositions on our child uh, when it comes to peer group i mean they all come from different backgrounds they have their own family values they are exposed to uh, the things that currently go on in the society in form of these songs that are there these days so we make him listen to old songs that we listen to that we think is fit for him we don't make him listen to the current contemporary songs uh, which which don't really perpetuate any value in fact they're very problematic at so many levels but how do we know that he will not get exposed to them once he's part of a peer group so there's also this dilemma because clearly uh, he's the only child in our like in our family context he want other children he want to be with them he want he wants to play with them um and he will eventually go ahead and play with them make friends and have his own social circle and that's extremely crucial and important uh, but how do we still sort of control it it is like a it's like swimming against the current for us as parents because the larger social fabric is not really supportive of what is it that we want to accomplish now be it schools or be it neighborhood uh, it's very difficult for all of us to be on the same page so we are just waiting for him to have maybe some reservoir of understanding or values so that he can navigate his way into this world uh, where which is not supportive of let's say being independent you know the world wants to condition the world wants to control the world wants to want children to conform so uh, how do we bring him up in a contemporary cultural context which expect something very different out of all of us that is uh, one of our major dilemmas uh, that's at actually at the root of our dilemma uh, when it comes to schooling and when it comes to socialization so uh, and then we see uh, some sense of uh, space and uh, you know context developing him for example yesterday we went to a cafe where the music was mellow was more soothing slow tempo and uh, he sat comfortably and so so the whole uh, context influences him so if the music is loud he gets more energetic he runs around more so so he responds to the surroundings but he has he is not yet able to control his surroundings so um, and himself so for example if there are uh, ex extended family members around he would not sleep he will be tired he will fall out of tiredness but he will not sleep he will not close his eyes so then we would have to ask everyone to either go home or we would have to uh, turn off the lights make everyone keep silent and then we tell him that see see everyone is asleep and then he will he would relax and fall asleep so it's like he has this fear of missing out that uh, you know i would miss out if i will sleep but at yeah. the same time it's so interesting to note that he does not have fear of dark which most children do so there are i mean what are the indications that sometimes make us feel that we are so far we have been able to manage it decently enough is that uh, <laughs> he feels free to express his opinion uh, he is curious he asks so many questions 
he's not really afraid of things like ghost or dark or whatever uh, because uh, he just feels free he does not have that sense because we have not really conditioned him in that way there are times he feels free to talk about things which may not be so desirable so for example once we were uh, once we were doing some shopping and he just saw another uh, older child and he came and told me that adu is bacche ko marega <laughs> and we were we tried reasoning with him ki kyu karoge aisa unko dard hoga and everything instead of just telling him ki nahi ye galat baat hai uh, so i mean there are like of course we get these indications that uh, he's for now doing fine and i hope we are able to sort of build on to that so yeah i mean fear is one thing that he does not know too much as of now so which gives him a lot of liberty of exploration he feels free to go ahead venture into the world uh, he uh, he's compassionate towards animals uh, we are trying to get him to wean off from his bottle and we told him that oh you know there is a small kitten who needs a bottle and why don't you uh, give away your bottle so that the kitten can also uh, drink milk from the bottle the cat wants the bottle for his kitten uh, her kitten so uh, he said okay fine adu de dega apni bottle you know those small it's small gestures do. just like when is compassion do. <laughs> so yeah. he's developing that yeah i have many ek de do <laughs> yeah so wow. also so, uh, and another such indication is that uh, even when he has to play he asks for books to be read to him so he has his own library we have we have a dedicated almira for him in and and there is a shelf in which all his books are placed and there are multiple spaces at home so he picks up a book ye pad ke sunao mujhe adu ye book padega wo book padega so so like he's playing right now so he just explores ye okay, what is there so if he feel likes any cover any there is any photo or anything he would just pull it out look at it uh, till today i don't think he has ever torn any book he he can torn newspaper he will torn a newspaper uh, tear off a newspaper he will tear off any any paper piece of paper lying around but he never tears off any page yeah so has he has this intuitive sense can name be this is a book he also feels very comfortable in nature as much as we have observed him uh, and usually i mean i have seen other children of his age group who have much more exposure to screen and cartoons and television uh, i just feel that you know that exposure to tv and cartoons and mobile phones it just limits observative like absorptional and also observational capacities of children they are just so transfixed uh, transfixed as if they are hypnotized by that screen that they generally lose that larger sense of curiosity mm-hmm. and most of the time parents are using those screens as babysitters or they just switch on the tv and then they feed the child because the child is so absorbed in the tv and then you can do just keep on feeding the child they don't understand the texture of the food they don't understand the flavors uh but they it's like as if uh, the screen has control over them so currently that's not really the case but again i mean uh, going forward it's a dilemma that how would we be able to maintain this uh, as he grows older and older as he starts asserting himself because we are also teaching him to be assertive through autonomy so yeah let's see i i guess we'll just take it as day i mean we'll just navigate the bridge when we reach there for now yeah i mean these are some of the things that we are using uh, but again we understand that we are hugely privileged in that sense you know and we are able to do many of these things because of our privilege first level of privilege is a certain degree of financial security that we have uh, we can afford those books and we can afford uh, you know we are blessed uh, to have our elders with us uh, who are who are trying as hard as we are to make sure that uh, he's educated the right way he's taken care of the right way so there may be small differences in what we think is right but nonetheless we all love him equally and we all care for him equally so that's a that's like i don't know if we would have been able to do this had just the two of us been there and with our working schedules so i want i have so much of gratitude for my in-laws 
and for other caregivers in our family that we are able to uh, implement what we are sharing with you so of course there is a financial privilege there is a privilege of a family around us there is a privilege of a certain degree of education and knowledge that both of us bring to our parenting we are privileged to have been exposed to the ideas of krishna murti whose uh, whose guidance has informed some of the very key decisions that we are taking in our parenting uh, we are also privileged in the sense that uh, you know we uh, we come from a certain socio economical cultural background uh, which sets us apart from many other people uh, who don't come from a similar background we lost your sound we have lost your sound and to give you we can't hear you we have lost your sound yeah uh, i think we so, couldn't hear her last two minutes yes because... yes i'll i'll ask her to uh, speak again yes, so uh, yeah so uh, i think she's trying to reconnect mama ke baad chal okay go they couldn't hear the end uh, what you said Hello, come here mama come here Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm audible now. Yes, yes, you are. Yes. So I was saying that uh, I understand that it takes a lot of privilege for us to be able to do what we are doing. So we understand that many of the things that we are doing as parents may not be possible for other people to do because they come from a different background, different context. They have different set of challenges. uh but hopefully some of these ideas will make us think how alternatively we can go ahead and uh, do something as important as parenting yeah so vikas over to vikas now hey mamma ka ha so uh oh mamma ka So this, this whole idea that a child has to be authentic, has to, uh, you know, be, should should be free to do and say what comes to his or her mind, and then judge. So uh, we are trying to uh, navigate through uh, imparting our own judgment onto him and and uh, letting him develop his own. So. Yeah, I think we should take a pause here, and if you have any questions, and I, 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 uh, uh, there were some comments regarding connecting all that with uh, senior, uh, I mean, adult students and young adult uh, students. So we'll do that in 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 the discussion. But let's let's take some more questions as of now. Okay, thank you, thank you, Vikas, and I'm sure it was a really very interesting discourse and. i must congratulate you for trying this new way of raising a child because in our country we don't have a training program for parents unfortunately and uh, you know children just come and we raise it raise by uh, discussing it with our parents or grand parents and so on that's the way things have been going on and let me tell you of my own experience of being in a kasmuti school where we don't handle or deal with such small children but children who are about 8 9 years old and they have some conditioning way when they come to our schools but of course they are not crystallized so it's a real challenge as to when should we introduce technology to the child you know because small children are full of wonder and we take away all that by, by answering their questions rather than them to explore So I, I think you are doing a great job by making the child see for himself what it is. But we can't deprive children from technology, you know. So one has to take a call as to when do you do that. And in a society where 
so much emphasis is being given on cleverness being hard face the world how do you explain kindness to a child that you should be kind you should be sensitive you should be compassionate you know i just came last night from chennai where we had a meeting of the governing body and we spent one full day with the schools discussing as to how do you prepare your children of 11th and 12th to go and face the world outside where there is so much caste division religious division how do you protect those children and it's a real challenge but i must tell you one thing you know kids they talked about truth so can we accept facts as they are without any association with it there are difference i am different from somebody else i am different from you but those are differences not necessarily leading to division so can we stay with facts that is very very important uh, i will again say i really like your presentation and the way you are going through it but you know a child gets educated by the whole society from neighbors when he goes to other children and plays with him how do you protect him so i think the child should be ready to face things as they come and with goodness if he has that we all have that innate goodness in us but you know we are society brings all kinds of ways to handle them that is the problem that we face i wish you all the all the luck in raising your child and i have number of questions i'll start with harshad bhai first yes harshad ji please unmute yourself <coughs> yeah are you able to hear yes i am yes thank you uh, dr vikas and dr anshu and dubey ji uh, you talk mostly about uh, how you are observing your own son and uh, about the parenting part you spoke in great detail uh i have no experience like that because i never married and no wife and no child but i was in krishnamurt schools for many many years and i was a house parent that means a house master and looking after children of older age not very young and uh, i am very much interested in krishnamurti's educational vision and uh, you spoke very little about it and uh, i would like to say that krishnamurti's vision was to uh, awaken the real intelligence or he sometimes used to say a new brain or a religious mind which is not conditioned by a uh, religion and nationality and all that and uh, i am very much interested so as a house master i used to talk with students of my house and also as a class teacher i used to talk about uh, uh, how do we live in this world how to grow with intelligence and um, what actually happens to a student or a child when the child grows up i think it depends on three factors one is i feel the child brings with himself or herself from the past lives that is what is i feel that way and of course how the parents a father and mother how they bring up the child when they are very young because father and mother are the first teachers in the life of these children so if the parents are very much uh, very good very honest very intelligent and very careful then certainly that affects the child when the child grows up but later on when the child goes to the school then the environment and their friends uh that also affects so there are three factors and a uh, parent cannot control uh the behavior when the child grows up and the child is more affected 
by the friends and what they observe in society. So uh, in Krishnamurti schools, of course, the environment is very good and we don't allow students to have mobile and there's a beautiful nature and a lot of silence and uh, everything is taken care of. So the environment is very, very beautiful. But what happens to them after they leave the school, it depends on their parents and their friends. And we find that uh, some of the students, they pick up bad habits of drinking, smoking, and uh, their life is not so much affected by the schooling and the parents, but what happens to them later on. So I think I have said enough. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Arshad Bhai. Thanks a lot. Uh, Vikas, would you like to comment or should we go to the next question now? No, uh, I would like to just uh, take what Arshad Bhai just said that, uh, you know, when, when students come to us and we both teach in college, uh, so we, uh, Anshu teaches uh, undergrad and I teach postgraduate at uh, PhD. Most of the students and scholars uh, we encounter, they have a deep sense of uh, extreme self-criticism, self-rejection, uh, an inability to articulate their own position, even formulate a position. And uh, so they basically don't, don't feel that they have anything of worth to contribute to the class or to the discussion, or they don't have any sense of ownership of any idea and you know, even of their own opinions. So often when I ask them, write whatever you believe, so it's, it's very uh, alien to them that they are asked to express their true opinion and asked then I ask them to justify it. So uh, and they, 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 then they realize during the justification that they have so much so many contradictory ideas and so much of contradiction that uh, they feel amazed that how are they able to uh, uh, live and work in their everyday life, Anshu? Yeah, so I also sense this uh, constant tussle in my students and I also, uh, I practice as like, I'm learning narrative therapy and there are so many uh, conversations that I have with young people and there's this huge sense of fragmentation in their life. They're living lives in compartments. So there's someone else when it comes to social media, there's someone else when it comes to their personal space, there's someone else when it comes to academics, there's someone else when it comes to personal hobbies. And uh, there is such like, it's like a constant fight going on within. And one part of that, one part of the fight is like who they truly are, what they really want from life, what they want to be. And one part of it is what is okay in society to be and not to be. So the social strips and their personal authenticity, it's in constant struggle. And as a result, they, they are languishing a lot of times. They don't know which path they want to take. So uh, this, this splitting of, uh, this splitting within, this fight within is something we are consciously, we ideally speaking in an ideal world, we don't want our child to have. But as we said that, it's only that it's only a limited thing that we can do as parents. Of course, he will go out in the world. He'll go. He'll go to schools. He'll talk to other people. He'll be with a peer group. So there's no way of really knowing. But as long as we consciously address this going forward, and we engage him in conversations which are about his thoughts as much as they're about his feelings, uh, where we are not giving that constant sense of judgment to him that we only value you if you do this and not do this. I think uh, we, if not entirely, we should be able to make him at least conscious that, yeah, I mean, this is this is how I want to live my life. So that is our hope. And um, problem sometimes comes in when people are not aware that there is a fight going on within. And there are like two ways of living life. And they are, so they believe as if what world 
tells them and what society tells them is the only way to live and everything else is wrong and they feel guilty so that guilt we don't want our like we don't we want to don't want to create a space for that thank you thank you uh, we'll take the next question now mr dinesh wagmare yes please are you able to listen to me vikas sir yeah uh, i would just like to share my some of the my observations uh, this uh, scripture our scripture says that whatever the state of uh, uh, mind of the parents at the time of conception normally that uh, occurs in the children then i tried to see this in myself as well as my son and i found that whatever my parents were facing the challenges at the time of the, uh, my conception almost similar challenges i have to face in my life similarly i found in my son also whatever the my attitude my behavior was there at the time of his conception similar behavior he was also showing so it is very interesting then i observed others also and i found that more or less there is a band in which we found that this uh, comes out to be the truth so this is one thing uh, one should be we should note this another thing is uh, say means for example suppose the parent is dominating then either the uh, child will also pick up the same tendency or he will be less confident means it will be suppressed or this thing so we have to uh, just observe that thing. number 2 what child pick up your energy means suppose you are having dilemma dilemma means uh, whatever you said that we are having dilemma dilemma means uh, it is coming from your uncertainty what will happen to him or how he will grow in future and that is basically coming from the your uh, fear basically there is a fear behind it so there is a insecurity so he will if you uh, possess this energy for some time he will automatically pick up that energy so you have to look into that factor also whatever the energy you are processing your confidence your this thing he automatically picks it up whether you tell him or not or whether you guide him or not then another thing is a situation outer situation that is not in your control you have to make your own world uh, somehow so if you uh, expose him to the screen or not uh, it is immaterial he will be exposed so so you have to be you have to be uh, give him the chance to uh, for the exposure to the sc- screen and let him uh, be uh, uh, let him throw in the water and let him under <laughs> learn how to swim so you have you can train him for swimming but he has to face the water so these are my observations what you have to say on this definitely true definitely true uh, i don't know about the conception and uh, the relation part but the yeah the later part i i, I totally agree uh, because uh, he was a pandemic baby so he, he didn't go to uh, uh, out of home apart from hospital uh, anywhere during the pandemic in and at least the initial one and a half year almost so uh, he has been in touch with parents uh, with uh, in laws with grandparents with everyone uh, through phone so he's he's very familiar very comfortable with technology and he knows that you know we are going we are, we are taking pictures so that, that's definitely there uh, also when uh, uh, like for example our our dilemma about sending him to school or not so we have found a school i mean a play school nearby it's just a two room play school with our maybe four or five children but uh, so it's clean it has some toys and it mm-hmm. has no screen so irrespective of who is engaging at least he we ask him do you want to go to school he says yes so he has a small bag that he takes to school and he he goes there one day he went for 10 minutes the other day for 15 minutes one day he stayed there for one hour then he says no adu ki chutti aaj adu nahi jayega so uh, we we do uh, you know we are trying to prepare him to uh, en- engage with the outer world 
no matter which kind of classes he go to because he doesn't have a conception of a school so wherever he goes he thinks that's the school uh similarly there is a there is an uh, a, a basic school in in my department ci it's, it's called ci experimental basic school so it doesn't have a nursery but it begins with class 1 so uh, sometimes i think that uh, once he is able to uh, uh, be aware of his body better that he is able to tell what he needs i think i I'll, i'll sometimes take him there he may be in that space for some time and then i'll bring him to my office so all these ideas are there so it's not that um, uh we 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 are not experimenting we are experimenting and we ask him what he wants to do because he every day sees children going to school so he has that you know, children go somewhere and they go together so that sort of the the, the role play to of going to school we engage him in it uh but yes, he has a pitch up on energy that i agree with so, so i want to take this opportunity to add one thing um i think parenting is more about self work and i agree that there are so many things that children pick up because they see their parents instead of what their parents are trying to teach them so parenting i think it's as much as self work as it is working with the child so uh, i think uh, if we ourselves keep on working on our spiritual path as long as we keep on resolving our own conflicts as long as we uh, live authentic to ourselves he'll pick up those things from us uh, so i think uh, thank you so for pointing out the importance of uh, so many things that children uh, i would not say automatically but yes i mean we are the role models as parents we are the first teachers as parents so the kind of beings we are is something that the child would also embody and therefore we carry a huge responsibility of also working on ourselves thank you thank you uh, thank you anshu ji we'll go to mr pradeep verma yes verma sir mm. uh, you are able to hear to hear my voice yes right yeah good to see two youngsters exploring life and education in the light of krishna murti really i am very happy about it then i have two questions do you think specialization helps in improving the level of education to me specialization is going deeper into one aspect of a field greater energy input in one branch only fortunately the topic today highlights the word vision which is to me the most holistic and pure insight that can guide receptive heart and minds take a story and I, i i my brains have been narrowed down by specialization by all that business take a said it long back so this question is related to how specialization in this education and more so in medical education has really helped then my second question is does the jargon of highly structured education affect our seeing ability affect our seeing ability they said our problem is can we immediately and all together stop thinking in terms of becoming now this becoming is a very great thing these days everybody this is a big virus becoming that is the only new approach in jk major hurdle to understanding one's present state of being which he called what is so these are the two questions and then another question that came up to me is while listening to you are you experimenting with your only child having in your background a lot of academia is it a controlled parenting differently when you say we don't want this and we don't want don't you say we want something when you say we don't want this we want something so this is another question that came to me i'll be happy if you respond to halaki this uh, a new hub global academy has come when right to be happy 
you see, that is their motto, right? To be happy, all the students, all the children. So these are new concepts are definitely coming, but these are small things that came to my mind. I'll be happy if you respond to these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure, sir. Thank so, you very much. Uh, I, uh, I would agree that specialization uh, does limit our uh, ability to look at things. Uh, I have my bachelor's in sciences. So till my bachelor's, I didn't know much about Krishnamurti. Uh, then I entered education and I learned about Krishnamurti and other philosophers, etc. So uh, that was very superficial. And uh, at that time, uh, maybe because of age, and uh, or maybe because we didn't reflect that much at that time. Uh, but it was more also in context of the formal schooling structures. Then I came to psychology and my specialization was clinical psychology. Uh, I would not say that I developed a vision of life in, in all these specializations. It was only, and then with the moment I realized it, I, I tried finding a perspective which can uh, uh, be a guiding uh, sort of framework for both profession and you know across these boundaries, personal, professional, and all that. Uh, so I narrowed down to uh, uh, humanist existential framework and then to Krishnamurti. So yes, uh, I think uh, national uh, yes specializations do impact our ability to look at things, and uh, the, the the moment we uh, uh, get a more general and broader idea, it it helps us uh, take better decisions. Uh, the second was about uh, you know this this academic backdrop, uh, the the whole library. So uh, I think, uh, and, and there are people these days who talk about him, you know, uh, burning the boats and not referring to any unnatural toy or un, uh, not, not referring to any book or any theory. Uh, I think uh, people who talk about all this also create a theory. So I don't uh, uh, see theory as something which is prescriptive. Yes, it has certain principles but uh, and, and certain assumptions, but I think we need to choose our own theory. And uh, for, for example, everyone here has uh, uh, chosen Krishnamurti as a, 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 a broad theory. I mean, Krishnamurti doesn't theorize, but he has a broad perspective or, or direction to live by. So I think that is necessary. And uh, then the next, the, the next challenge that comes to every academic is uh, to be informed and yet to not let all that information come to uh, uh, create more confusion and come to hinder uh, the progress. So that's second. So there unlearn, I mean, whatever we call is unlearning or uh, putting things in the backdrop and using them wherever and, you know, putting things in their right spots or appropriate places. I think that's important. Uh, and last, uh, I agree that when we say we don't want this, we also are saying we want this. But then all education, all life, the moment we say direction, it is normative. There are inherent judgments of right and wrong. So yes, when I say we don't have, want our child to be exposed too much to screens, then what we are saying is that we don't value whatever appears on screen. So for example, for my nephew, um, I collected uh, 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 cartoons because he likes he liked cartoons. So I watched cartoons all over again and I chose Mowgli for him, uh, DuckTales, another, so I chose cartoons that if he's interested in cartoons, let me first look at the cartoons again and decide which one promotes which kind of values. So I think even when we say Krishnamurti is alternative, what we are saying is that 
the values that krishna murti promotes suggests indicates at are worthy but again it's all normative i i don't think we can escape normativity being as both parents as and as teachers so that's my response anshu yeah so as far as a uh, specialization and the value of specialization is concerned i would say that problem is not really specialization i think the problem is what we understand by education and how we have limited it to information which pertains to specialization um, so the moment we have a broader vision of education which is education for life education for holism uh, specialization will have its own space because clearly we cannot deny the benefits that we enjoy of specialization be it in medicine be it in academia be it in psychology yeah i think there's some um, network connection error there i think audio problem is yes. yeah may i make a comment so yes. yes please go ahead yeah uh, i like what khalil gibran said that they are not your children they come through you they have their own life and you can't really uh, figure out everything uh, at a young age that what kind of human being uh, he or she will be okay i finish thank you thank you i think we'll take the last question now durga ji please go ahead uh, hello yeah good afternoon uh, mr uh, vikas and uh, you know uh, anshu yeah it's it's good to see young people and along with the small baby <laughs> i think the, a lot of my seniors you know the uh, elderly lot they have given lot of uh, suggestions and good tips to you people so i also have some kind of a suggestions or maybe you can say tips or contributions because we have uh, gone through the same phase i had been a mom and now i am a grandmom Uh, my grandkids are even much uh, older than your uh, little baby yeah as uh, i would like to say you know when he is a toddler just enjoy him you know <laughs> yeah, enjoy the childhood because the innocence the wonder it's not going to last for long enjoy with him you know that's the one thing i would like to say because more than we teach them they teach a lot of things to us it's a learning process and uh, parenting i would like to say it's a like long learning process uh, there are never like you know with the pauses there it, it, same is the case with my my daughters they grown up now they we share everything with them if uh, yeah so i would like to say and uh, uh, they say like you know when the kid is small it's very easy to think so much but the problem comes when they go into their teenagers uh, they you know teen teens and uh, when they face the existential problems of their life will we be there that time also so those are the challenges we have to make up our mind initially itself because we need to save our energy also if we are start, start spending so much of energy <laughs> when the small child just enjoy you know i i would like to say uh, like you know when uh, my kids were small i also had i was a mom uh, didn't have any knowledge ex experience of what it is to be like to be and uh, but i have uh, figured out few things for myself like make them uh, skilled you know uh, introduce lot of skills to them when they are in the in the uh, primary schools and all make them disciplined let them do their work on their own uh, let them know how to keep their keep things tidy put their things in order and like you know introduce them like you know broad skills of life like you know painting music drawing you know uh, dance all these things that's how my start if a parent adopts their own strategy so i used to feel you know it's a long story life is not a one time affair if the child is born he's going to be there through for uh, you know as long as he's alive and as long as i'm alive so it's going to be a mutual learning process i learn lot of things from them and they learn lot of things from me and there is nothing called the best way the, the do you know we are simply human beings we are not some kind of a perfections you know and embodied or something like that so keep that in mind you know they the best you can do and uh, my suggestion is you know nothing like you know giving your time your patience and your energy for the child nothing can beat that the, the best of the schools also cannot do him do any good to them 
the amount of attention, love, and care you give to your child, and like that is going to be for all through life. Not on, not only for the, if they are good, they're showing good behavior, even if they are bad, even if they've committed mistakes, errors. So what? Uh, you have to give so much of attention to them. Uh, sorry if it is lacking, look, looking looking like, more like a monotonous. Uh, I would like to give some small suggestion also here. Uh, like now, if both of you are um, you know educators and you face a lot of uh, teenage students in your careers, and uh, and the, the, the students may not be as privileged as your the attention you are giving to your kid. So these kind of views, I feel the teenagers, the younger generation are the future of our societies. You know, if you start paying more attention to them also, and uh, I think the, uh, the care and attention and, uh, you know, the impart to them, I think automatically it gets translated to your kid, but that maybe that's more kind of a compassion. When you also show that kind of a concern for the students whom you face in your colleges, in your schools, how much are you attending to them? You know, I think this is all a kind of a interwoven process. The way we are, we affect the kid. However you teach them, you know, they won't get affected. They see the person the way the person is. That goes a long way in their understanding and their, uh, you, know, uh, you know, following some values or something like that. So this is a, uh, uh, sorry if uh, the suggestion is a, a bit out of place, that because that's what I have written there. Because uh, that is the uh, area we need all need to focus upon the youngst youngsters of these days. They are uh, directionless. They, they may not be as privileged as coming from good parenting, parents and good resources. They may not be having. But as an educators, as people who have been touched with all these things, are we able to do that job also as well? Uh, because I was also a teacher and these dilemmas, you know, I always perpetually had been going through and, uh, and the dilemmas are good. As long as the questions are there, the dilemmas are there, at least we try to answer them. We try to find out some solution for them. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. And I, I agree with you uh, that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's not just young children who need support. Everyone, everyone needs that. So uh, one thing I would just like to add to uh, uh, the things that you just mentioned, uh, and which is communication. I think what we are trying to do here is develop channels and ways to communicate. And this often happens with uh, our, our uh, uh, adult students as well. So often, uh, you know, it happens that uh, people wish you during the corridors when, uh, uh, when you walk through the corridor. So, uh, you know, sometimes you see people and I often, you know, ask them, are you okay? Are you all right? And uh, for many, it's something that no, no one has ever done. That if they are worried or they are sad, someone, let alone a teacher, identify it outside the classroom and then ask and be concerned about it. So I totally agree with you that yes, every, I mean, even adult students need that kind of attention and adolescents even more. So, yeah, I agree. But again, uh, I think uh, communication is uh, uh, something which which cuts across this age, these age groups. Thank you. Thank you, Vikasji. I think our time is over, but we have two hands raised. Uh, may I request Harishji and Nansha to please be very, very brief because we have already crossed our time. So please unmute and make it very brief. Okay, uh, no, namaste. Uh, early on in the session, uh, Ansu, because they raised a, a point of God and they are not imposing uh, the ideas uh, of God on their child, that is fine. Uh, but uh, uh, it looks, uh, it, look, it appeared as though they felt uh, guilty using this word. Uh, just let us remind ourselves that it is not that Krishmurti was against the use of this word. And in the same breath, uh, he often has talked about uh, God, truth, or whatever uh, enlightenment, whatever you call it. That is one thing. Uh, another thing, uh, to Krishmurti, God was not something to be flattered through puja part. First point. Second point. God was nothing, not something to be feared either. 
third thing but he did talk about the the sense of inquiry 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 about everything because i i, I may not impose my ideas on my uh, child as i never did but i told them that my dear babies the world is divided the whole world is divided on two lines one is nationality nationalism and another is re uh, religion so expose your child to the realities of life second thing i expose i i made it a point while walking with my uh, two kids i never had a car in my life at least not until now we walked um, uh, sometimes longer distances and i paused i i and papa what are you seeing kya dekh rahe hain and some beautiful river or trees i did not tell them they also must but they imbibed that there was something good about it and then i paused at the slum the hurts the dirty squalid streets people begging papa ab kya hua i said look at them yeah but i don't like to see them i said yes but that is the reality so let them live with gratitude it is not important whether our child believes in god or not believe but they should live with gratitude gratitude to whom maybe nature universe you know in recent times i am glad that is, uh, there are thinkers who don't use the word uh, they, 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 they don't talk about karma but they say uh, what you give to the universe comes back to you also the old english uh, idiom what goes around comes around so expose your child uh, expose means not i don't want to sound didactic uh, instructional let us expose our child to the realities of the world the beauty and the ugliness both it will sharpen their faculty of observation thank you very much thank you thank you thank you parish ji yeah. we'll take the last comment anta uh, ji namaste uh, bahut acha lag raha hai dono ko dekhkar uh, bahut uh, khushi hui dono ke naye naye bachcho ko dekhkar ki bacche kis tarah se trained hain और अपने किस तरह से जय कृष्ण मूर्ति को अपनी लाइफ में बच्चों के साथ में किस तरह से देख पा रहे हैं हम लोग नई जनरेशन को बीइंग ए दादी मैं अपने एक्सपीरियंस सुनाना चाहती हूँ कि अपने बच्चों को वी कैन गिव लव एंड ए डायरेक्शन हाउ टू हाउ टू सी द वर्ल्ड ब्यूटी ऑफ वर्ल्ड द ट्रीज द प्लांट द स्काई द रिवर एंड वॉटर एंड ओनली the gratitude and uh, we can give the kindness um, to the our children and to see the how the world is beautiful and jo aap kar rahe hain dono dono bachcho ke upar ki kis tarah se direction dena hai ye bhi matlab ek achhi achhi approach hai apne world ke liye ki apan kis tarah se apne world ko sundar bana sakte hain main abhi usa mein hu to bhi 2 baj rahe hain to main isliye थोड़ा भी वो नहीं कर पा रही हूँ पर मुझे अच्छा लगा आप दोनों को देख के जय कृष्ण मूर्ति स्टडी सर्कल में और खुशी हुई इसके लिए धन्यवाद दोनों को थैंक थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू the mother experiments that they are doing with their life uh, i want to announce the next talk next sunday we'll have dr deepthi malhotra and uh, she is going to talk on intelligent revolt the role of education so those of you who are free please do join us next sunday at 11 o'clock thank you and goodbye thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you dubey ji thank you benival anshu ji and the kid <laughs> thank you thank you thank you please close mode